What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It's excellent to have you here as always, and thank you for watching. Today's another one spawned from the comment section, and I can't pass up the immense river of ideas that you guys provide, as well as the intellectual input. Some of y'all are mean, but you know, that is what it is. Now, today's video is on 45 cans and why they suck. And I'm not doing this video just to bash on a product line or a product classification. This is important to me that you get this right because this shit is expensive. This can, for instance, I think comes in, or at least at the time that I purchased it was about a thousand dollars. And I don't know about you, but when I make a thousand dollar purchase, that's something I have to research. I can't just buy thousand dollar things continuously. I have to do my homework. If you spend a thousand dollars on something and then a $200 tax stamp and 10 months of your life and the, the hours related to doing the paperwork, getting it done properly and submitting it to the government for approval. And this thing comes into your possession after all that completes and it doesn't meet your expectations, well, you're gonna be like, well, that was dumb. Even though the whole process with the NFA is dumb. If that happens to you, you are less likely to participate in that market again. You are also less likely, if this thing does not meet your expectations, to take it out and show all your buddies so they get bit by the suppressor bug as well. The regulations on these things are absolutely ridiculous here in the United States. Many European countries and Canadian provinces, these are totally cool. But here in the United States, we have some kind of sick fascination with regulating our rights into obscurity. The only way that regulations on devices like these reaches a point of objective sanity is if they are widespread, as in every single person owns them. I would still classify this as a niche product category. It's an emerging product category. It's becoming more and more popular every single day. However, it is still not owned by everyone. If you experience circumstances, as I mentioned previously, you are less likely to facilitate that movement. The way that movement has developed is more and more people using them and then showing them to their friends, more and more people become involved. You are less likely to participate in that whole process if you're not having a good time. That was a really long explanation of why I'm so invested in this. I apologize in advance. Now we're gonna take a sponsor break. America was founded on the principles of freedom. And I hope that you guys have figured out by now that there are people whose sole purpose in life is to work against those freedoms at all costs. The founders called that one. They told us in advance that it was gonna take a lot of work to keep the Republic. And there's a lot that you can do through various outlets today both individually and collectively, to do your part to make sure that your freedoms, liberty, and the Republic are kept. The National Association for Gun Rights is an organization whose sole function is to push on issues up for congressional action from a position of no compromise. In recent news, they helped get constitutional carry across the line in Utah, Montana, Tennessee, Iowa, and Texas. And they are also a key player in the movement to stop the Waco Wacko from being confirmed as the ATF director. Winning, 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 winning. Their current entrenchment is against federal and state level red flag proposals. And they sponsored today's video to get the word out about their efforts. I'll have a link in the description box where you can follow up with them and learn more about the things that they going on. And if being a 2A organization that's actually out there lobbying doing stuff instead of wasting money on frivolous things like some organizations do. They're giving away a tank soon to one of their members. So yeah, you should probably go at least take a look. <laughs> That's a pretty epic raffle if I do say so myself. I can't say that we've ever given away a tank. Hats off to them. Special thanks to them for making today's video possible. Not a lot of people shoot 45 in relative comparison to a lot of the other things that are out there. It was a lot more popular 10, 15 years ago than it is today. And that's mainly because 9mm has wiped the floor with absolutely everything. I'm still rooting for 10 though. In my experience, there are really two types of people that gravitate towards 45 cans. On one hand, you got the people that say, hey, it's bored out to 45. If it fits, it ships. I can use it on everything I own because I don't own anything that's larger than 45. And then the other camp is, hey, 45 ACP, generally speaking, is subsonic, so therefore I don't have to go out and find expensive subsonic ammunition for my pistol to be able to enjoy my suppressor. How do I say this without being an ass? Both those positions that I just described 
they sound like they ought to be plausible, right? Like, like they both have objective information that backs up the position that we can accept as true, and they just sound like they should be the truth. The only problem with that is <laughs> there's other information that has been sequestered behind a regulatory veil. And what I mean by that is because of the draconian nature of the regulations associated with these products, the information on them is not as free flowing as just about everything else in the world, but this is absolutely ridiculous. I'm going to not get on a soapbox. We're just going to keep on going, Kurt. And because of that, that information may overshadow some of those criteria that we talked about earlier. So which one do you guys want first? You guys can't answer me. That doesn't make any sense. Go get a coin. All I could find was this absolutely wrecked penny. It'll do. Heads, 45 is subsonic. Therefore, the cans are going to be great. And tails, if it fits, it ships. Going to the range. So what we've got going on here is a setup that I developed some years ago as a means to be able to show you guys the difference between two or more things on the range. The greatest thing about cameras is that they have these great big condenser microphones and I paid a lot of money for that microphone and the one that's on the side there too, there's two of them, to be able to give you guys quality audio. And what's great about them is they take really loud things and really quiet things and they bring them to the middle. This thing is so good that you guys, half the time when I'm editing video, it sounds like I got emphysema because it can literally detect the, the rasp of the air leaving my lungs sometimes. <laughs> it's kind of disconcerting actually. It's not actually that loud. It's just the microphone's that good. That said, when we're doing stuff on the range, just about everything we're talking about is really loud. And because of that, you don't get a one-to-one -one comparison, which is also a good thing because that means that you don't have to sit there in your living room and watch a video of ours with hearing protection on. What the problem with that is, is when we're talking about cans and really loud things, that you're not gonna be able to tell the difference between two things that are really loud when they lie outside the detection limits. The thing about sound is that it's logarithmic and it's distance driven. So through a lot of tuning and a lot of setup, I have a way to be able to move off from the camera and be able to get the sound from what we're doing to lie within the detection range of my equipment to show you guys what the actual difference is. Let's get to it. Real quick to explain what it is you guys just saw, I started out with the fixed barrel spacer in the can on purpose, and I kind of forgot that I did it. That's why it looked a little bit wonky. I did it because I didn't want the gun to open. I turned those into basically bolt action firearms, so the only sound that you guys are getting is the sound the bullet makes and the sound that was coming out of the front of the suppressor. All the other two sources of sound were eliminated from this whole thing for the purposes of today's video. I mentioned earlier, I was gonna to get to why I was using this as a demo, and that's because I have this. This is the Obsidian 9, this is the Obsidian 45, 45 variant, nine millimeter variant, both from Rugged Suppressors. And this is arguably the best 45 can on the market. As in, I'm not just invested in it because I purchased it. I mean that I know two owners of suppressor manufacturing companies, as in people who literally manufacture cans for a living that purchase this can because it's the best thing on the market. Rugged Suppressors did not sponsor today's video. However, if you want, give me a call and I'll tell you where you can send the check. Even though this is awesome, as demonstrated, it is not as good in performance as this guy. And this is very simple to figure out why. You'll notice these tubes are the same size. And a lot of suppressor manufacturers do this. They are going to use the same tube because it's an economy problem. And it's also a weight problem. 
These are roughly the same weight with a little bit more weight over here. You can't really add a whole lot of girth. And if you continue to increase the diameter of this thing, you're gonna include your sights and you're going to rapidly increase the weight because this has to operate on a semi-automatic pistol and it won't do that if it gets any heavier than this. This is really at the limit, like really at the limit. Because of that, we are depleting the usable space inside this can because we have a bigger bore. Let's do some math real quick. And I apologize for all of you who don't do numbers. The thing about it is these are just elements of what's going on inside the can. And it, this is probably an hour lecture on everything that happens inside of cans. And I could do that, but nobody would watch it. The thing is to really understand what's going on, we have to do calculus. And I have a rule about calculus and it basically goes something like, don't ever use it ever for anything under any circumstances. God gave man computers and that's their job. So you might think, ah, he's gonna talk about volume. Actually volume isn't as important as a lot of people make it out to be. It's important that you have sufficient volume to handle what's going on inside the can so there's enough volume to vent the expanding gas. But once you reach that critical point of enough volume, adding more doesn't really help you that much. Like if I took a 55 gallon drum and jammed a suppressor mount into it, it wouldn't perform better than say one of those cans that I showed you guys. Instead, we're gonna start with cross-sectional area, which we can use to understand the efficiency of any can. Looking at the two cans head on, represented by these two circles, they have an inside diameter of 1.08 inches. The diameter of the bore of the nine millimeter can is 0 0.408, and the bore of the 45 can is 0.5 inches. Remember that the area of a circle is pi r squared, making the bore area of the nine millimeter can 0 0.131 square inches, and the 45 at 0.196. What that tells us is the percentage of the baffle face that is available for blocking gas flow versus letting it through. So those calculations come out to 86 and 79% respectively. The second thing we can look at is the distance from the vent to the sidewall. And actually, side note, this is gonna be in reality worse because for this calculation I used the internal diameter of the tube and I didn't account for the fact that there's a thickness of baffle on both sides. It's actually gonna be less volume, which means that a larger bore is going to deplete it even more. So it's gonna be a higher percentage of the available distance. I'll be honest, I couldn't get the baffles out to measure the thickness. <laughs> Anyway, if you think in terms of radius to the sidewall, the 45 can loses 9% more. And what that means is that a particle traveling from the center is gonna have that much less space to slow down before it hits something hard and bounces off and then bounces again and bounces again. And you get the idea. Part two, if it fits, it ships. So the analogy that I would use is I can fit an 80 pound kettlebell in this box, but if I close it up, and just pick it up off the ground, it's going to tear through the bottom. You have to be very specific about the ratings that you're shopping for and pay very close attention to those. And remember that just because it's rated for a particular caliber doesn't mean that it sounds good either. So a rating is what will it survive, not what sounds good. And I want you to think of it in terms of like hot dog down a hallway. So if you shoot a little tiny round through a large space, the function of the can is to siphon and sequester gas as it expands behind the bullet. So the bullet leaves the muzzle, enters the suppressor, the gas comes along with it, it's got a blast wave behind it, that is going to expand to fill each of the individual chambers and what keeps it from moving around the bullet is the fact that those baffles get close enough to it to restrict some of that airflow. You're still gonna get some around the bullet because you have to build in some space for bullets alignment relative to the bore and the bore of the suppressor. And that's why like the Wolfman can, for instance, the, the baffles open up as you get closer to the end because a little bit of deviation at this end equals a lot down at that end. So I saw something the other day where somebody was like, yeah, I just got my short barreled 300 blackout and I'm gonna go buy an Osprey 45. No. A 45 can does not perform well at all when you put nine millimeter through it because there is just such a substantial gap between them. It's even worse if you use 30 cal, you're gonna have a much greater gap or around the circumference of that bullet relative to the 
bore diameter of the baffle stack and it's just gonna allow too much flow through. Be careful about marketing hype. To be able to operate on a semi-automatic pistol, this thing has to have a Nielsen device or a lid linear inertial decoupler. They come with that, or at least if it's a quality can, it comes with that. To get this to work on your fixed barreled gun, for that dude that was talking about using a 45 can for his 300 blackout gun, you have to buy a separate part for this, and it's gonna be about 80 bucks, maybe $100, of a new part to put in this thing to lock that piston into place, or you're gonna to have to get a direct thread end cap. I don't think that they make a direct thread end cap for this particular one. When it's on a semi-automatic pistol, it locks the fire rate. You cannot outrun this suppressor. It has to be back into the locked forward position before you can fire again. It will always beat the action of the gun. When it's on a fixed barreled gun, that's not the case. If you don't put that fixed barreled spacer in that, this thing can be doing this, while bullets are being sent down it, and that's not good. You will destroy it. Anyway, I could probably stand here and talk about 45 cans and cans in general for an hour or two, but this video would be completely unwatchable if I continued to do that. So that's all I'm gonna say on 45 cans. Don't get me wrong. If you gotta fit a 45 caliber projectile or a 40 caliber projectile, like a 10 millimeter or something like that, because 40's dumb. If you gotta fit something that a nine millimeter can won't handle, that guy right there.